6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We've been on this verse <clears throat> a couple of weeks because in it, the Apostle Paul just gives us a listing here of what we're talking about. There are some other verses, and you have a note sheet. I've put those on there as we go through. But this is a verse where he has incorporated several things as to the work <clears throat> of the Holy Spirit in salvation. And we have looked at this kind of from beginning to end. It's within several weeks, there's a lot of repetition, I know, but repetition is a good teacher. And if there, there's anything we need to know about, it is the depth and breadth of what Christ did to save us from sin and make us acceptable to a holy God. So, been a little lengthy <clears throat> sermon series, but I hope it has helped us to understand what Jesus has done for us. And we're looking at the results now of the work of the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit involves bringing, His work in our spirit involves bringing every spiritual blessing to those whom the Father has elected and for whom the Son died. And we've talked about regeneration as a result, washing as a result from all these from Scripture, sanctification as a result. And today we want to look at justification, another result of the work of the Holy Spirit, another benefit that we have because of Christ's finished work at the cross. So look at it again in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. In concise terms, Paul talks in verse 7 about what life is before faith, before becoming a Christian. Then in verse 11, 11, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Job, chapter 4 and verse 17, Job asked an interesting and most important question of all the questions that he asked. He asked this one, can mortal man be right before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? And I think why Job asked that question, he understood his own depravity. He understood his own sinfulness, his disobedience, his rebellion. He knew that he was unholy and that God is holy. And there was a gulf between. And he asked this pivotal, pivotal question. How can a man be right with God? Well, the Bible answers that, particularly in the New Testament. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 28, the Apostle Paul writes, For we hold that one is justified... By faith, apart from the works of the law, we are justified before God by faith and not by works. You may be thinking, Jack, why have you hit so hard on this these last several weeks? That justification is by faith alone. Because I've been doing this a long time. I've dealt with a lot of church folk, different denominations. And there are many who are sitting in our church pews today who will talk about grace all day long. Oh, I'm saved by grace. But when you, when you funnel, funnel that down and, and keep asking questions at the end, you will find that a lot of Protestant evangelical church folks still believe, yeah, but you got to live it. <laughs> they do in the bottom of their heart. And they particularly really don't believe in pure justification by faith. They don't understand that works don't work. Works don't work. And I've come to understand in many uh, over the years that Actually, the biblical doctrine of justification by faith is sometimes a hated doctrine 
even among church folks. Now, we used to hear, if you grew up in church, and, and this is true, preachers would say there's only two kinds of people in the world, saved and unsaved. Now, that's true. Today, you are either in a justified relationship with God through Christ by faith, or you are not. There's no nebulous area. There's no odd in between. You either know God through Christ or you don't. You're either saved or unsaved. Which causes me to make another statement. There are two beliefs as to how a person is saved. Some people believe what the Bible teaches. Justification by faith alone. That's what Scripture teaches. That's what we adhere to here at our church very strongly and very passionately. And then there is the group that says, yeah, faith is good, but you've got to add some works to it. You got, and then they make up their own work. That's the interesting thing. Again, where's the guideline? Where's the standard? Okay, if I have to add some works to my Christian faith to be justified and made right with God, how much, how many works I got to work? Amen? Where's the guideline? Well, you know, you ought to, you ought to go to church. Okay, how many times a year do I have to go to church? Well, you ought to give money. Great. How much money should I give? Well, you ought to do good deeds. Well, great. To whom and how much? There's unanswered questions there. And what we do when we think we can add works to our faith is this. We set our own standard in our own minds. And we're happy with our own standard. And then if somebody doesn't meet our standard. We claim they just don't love Jesus as much as I do. <laughs> Say amen. And we're comfortable with our standard. But you go to Scripture, and there's no clear-cut standard. Now, and I'm going to be dealing with this some next year, but yes, we're to live sanctified lives and holy lives and committed lives. Yes, and I think next year we're going to spend some time there. But, but as far as justified before a holy God, what makes that happen? According to Scripture, only the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life, and when that person is regenerated by the Spirit, washed by the Spirit, sanctified by the Spirit, justified by the Spirit, that is salvation. And I have to add nothing to that to be saved. But there are those who teach, well, I, I, you got to do something. Roman Catholicism is a religion of works. They talk about grace, but they have a different definition of grace than the Bible gives. Read their definition of grace. It's not grace, according to Scripture. Roman Catholicism is built on works, and every other religion in the world is built on works. Hinduism, uh, Islam. Every other, war, every other religion, Christianity is the only religion in the world that teaches justification by grace through faith alone. And that ought to be good news to us. That ought to be good news. In fact, it was the Protestant Reformation out of which this great teaching was renewed from Scripture. From the great men of John Calvin and Savannah Rolla and John Huss and John Knox and Martin Luther stood against the Roman Catholic Church and rose up and said, no, we are not saved by works. We are saved by grace through faith alone. And that became our Protestant Reformation, which we are delighted in. In fact, some people talk about the Protestant Reformation, I say, yeah, I'm still protesting. Because there's so many evangelicals that still think we're saved by works. So this is kind of why I talk about this. There's two kinds of people, saved and unsaved, and there's two beliefs as to how salvation comes, by faith or by faith plus works, so to speak. 
and they've created their own doctrine of salvation by faith plus works or by works alone, which circles back and simply makes them unsaved. If you're trusting any of your works for salvation, you are not a Christian. It is by Christ alone. That's the good news of the gospel. And if you further question a lot of church members about this idea of salvation, how we are really justified before God, you'll get some interesting answers. And you'll find that they're not depending on grace as much as you may think they are. It was Martin Luther from the Protestant Reformation. His story is a good one. Martin Luther was a Catholic priest, a learned, educated Catholic priest in Wittenberg, Germany. And he preached and followed Catholic theology and salvation by works. And to make penance for his sins, to pay for his sins, one of the things he did, he would climb up the stone steps, 10 or 12 of them, at the church at Wittenberg, stone steps on his knees. He would climb up stone steps on his knees to pay for, make penance for his sins. Now think about that. (laughs) To make penance for his sins. On a regular basis. Catholic theology. You've got to make penance for your sins. One day, Martin Luther, this Catholic priest, read the book of Romans. It's always good when a preacher reads the Bible. And he saw that Catholicism did not teach what the Bible taught about salvation. And he read that one little line, the just, those who are justified before God, the just shall live by faith. And that one little phrase revolutionized, God used that one little Roman phrase to revolutionize Martin Luther and his thinking and his theology. And he realized, no, I am not saved by works or making penance or climbing steps. I am saved thoroughly, comprehensively, exhaustively by faith that God gives to me to believe. It's a gift of God. And he and others like him... uh, began, again, what we call the Protestant Reformation, and thank God for those men. Some of them were killed, martyred by the Catholic Church. Martin Luther, his life was almost taken. He was dragged before the synods and and, uh, papal bulls were issued against him. A papal bull, that's a weird term, isn't it? But a papal bull was from the Pope, and the Pope would order these papal birds, and all they were were statements, were indictments, were charges, and the Pope uh, gave out these uh, indictments against Martin Luther and others, and it was kind of like putting a warrant out on them, so to speak, and the Catholics hounded them and pounded them and chased them, and Martin Luther had to defend himself many times before the Catholic Church. And in one great speech he made before one of those gatherings, he held up the scriptures and said, this is the word of God. I stand nowhere else. I stand nowhere else. So justification by faith, we can talk about a lot of other things in scripture and in Christianity. Things we might can disagree with and still fellowship. But ladies and gentlemen, there is only one way lost people come to Christ. 
and that is by grace, through faith, given solely by the Holy Spirit himself to us as a gift. That's it. We can't, we can't separate from that. So again, in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, and some were, such of, some were some of you, such were some of you, but you were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the Spirit, it's the work of the Spirit, the Spirit of our God. So I just want to share some statements with you about justification. We're not going to drill real deep about it. Let me just share some biblical statements with you about justification and what it means. Number one, justification is required. Why? Because y'all a bunch of sinners. And here we go right back to total depravity. Y'all have heard that, right? Okay. The same reason that regeneration is required, the same reason that washing is required, the same reason that uh, sanctification is required, it's because of our standing with God, outside of God, lost, wretched, separated from God. It is my sinfulness and depravity and Rebellion against a holy God that demands justification. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that man being Adam, as sin came into the world through Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men. Why, Paul says? Because all have sin. And that's your standing before God. A sinner. And with that you get everything a sinner receives. The condemnation of God. The wrath of God. Being an enemy of God. Being lost from God, all those words that Scripture uses to uh, identify what it means to be a sinner. And that's your standing, totally depraved, lost. And let me repeat, the remedy for lostness is not goodness. The remedy for total depravity is not turning over a new leaf or straightening up or flying right or, or just being a better guy. No, that changes nothing. We are diametrically opposed to God in the hands of an angry God. Our goodness is not good enough. Why? God doesn't demand goodness. He demands perfection. And that's, I know we don't get that in our, we don't get that. But Jesus was clear. Be perfect like, you're, like God in heaven is perfect. Be perfect. He demands perfection. He demands total righteousness. And we are not that. We're totally unrighteous, imperfect, sinful. So my total depravity demands that something miraculous has to happen. And this idea, my illustration for this has always kind of been this. Because it just kind of connects, syncs with my thinking a little bit. But to be unjustified before God, to be in this position, is to be out of square with God. To be out of square. Do y'all know what being in square is? Y'all know what that means. To be in square, y'all know what a square is? You square up a line to cut. 
Have you ever gone into a house and seen something that was out of square? That somebody didn't square a corner or square some trim or something? I've always, that's the way I've always thought about it. It's being out of square. God is here, and I'm out of square with him. I'm out of square with him. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter to what degree you're out of square. You're just out of square. It doesn't matter to what degree you are a sinner. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. It doesn't matter if I'm an axe murderer or just a guy that cheats on his taxes. Now, there's different consequences for those things. I understand. But we're both sinners. And we don't like that, do we? In fact, just now, probably some of you flinched in your brain. Your brain kind of went, hmm. Don't tell me that the axe murderer and I are on the same plane. Don't tell me that. You are exactly on the same level with that kind of sin. It doesn't matter to what degree you sin. We're all sinners. So it is required because of our total depravity. And one thing in this series I've tried to communicate is the depth and length to which, to which Jesus, through his son, went to redeem us. This is not a flippant thing. This is not a, a light thing. This is, you know, I, I know many, many folks treat their salvation just, you know, hey, you know, you know, it's just there. Yeah, I, I believe in God, and I go to church when I can, and, you know, but it's just a little compartment in their life, and they don't think about it very much until they need something and pray. But it's just this little pigeonholed compartment. And if we would ever understand the great length that our loving Heavenly Father went to, the great plan He made concerning redemption in eternity past, the great sacrifice He made to send His own Son to this hell-bound, wretched world to walk among people like me and to give his life on a cross and die my death, carry my sins, bear the wrath of God for my sins, rise from the dead and ascend back to the Father. We must understand the depth of that. We might appreciate our salvation more. And that's been one of my purposes here, to get us, this is not just some flippant prayer you pray at a VBS or at a tent revival. This is not just some, oh, yeah, I, I prayed that prayer. No, 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 no. This is God moving heaven and earth to save our wretched souls. And that is the serious matter we deal with when talking about salvation. So I'm out of square with God because my total depravity and nothing less than the plan of a perfect God through the atoning work of His perfect Son and through the application to us through His perfect Holy Spirit, nothing less than a miracle can solve that problem. You believe in miracles, Jack? I certainly do. And I begin with salvation. Salvation is a miracle. This used to be an old song we used to sing called It Took a Miracle. Any of you old folks remember that? Oh, I put my hand down. I'm not old. <laughs> it took a miracle. Here we go. All right, here we go. It took a miracle to hang the stars in space. It took a miracle to keep the world in place. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. Impressed? That was the chorus. That was the chorus. I can't believe I remembered that. And it's true. God turned the world upside down to deal with our depravity and save us. Don't you think for one moment 
that yours or my little pathetic goodness offsets that in any way. Salvation is a free gift. So, I need it because of my depravity. Secondly, that brings me to justification is a gift. Romans 3.24, Paul says, you are justified by his grace as a gift through, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It is a gift. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast about it and brag about it. That's what the reformers in the Protestant Reformation fought for. The reformers weren't creating new theology. They weren't trying to rewrite the Bible. Catholicism, and I'm just speaking history here. I'm not being condemning. This is history, church history. Catholicism had taken the Bible out of the hands of the common people. If you were a Catholic, you didn't have a Bible. You depended on the priest. Scary dependent on a preacher. Amen? <laughs> I mean, but, you know, whatever the Pope said through the priest, that, that, was, that was it. And the common people didn't, didn't have Bibles. Masses all over Europe, all the masses were done in Latin. Priests had to know Latin, and they were done in Latin. Common people didn't understand Latin. I mean, they went to church and heard church in a language they didn't understand. I want that to sink in. And the Pope claimed to have the authority, and still does, to speak what is called ex cathedra, which means to speak outside the cathedral or outside scripture. So they believe anything the Pope says is from God just like the scriptures are from God. Anything he says is inspired just as much as the scriptures are inspired. Are you all seeing any problems here? Again, I'm not condemning. I'm just saying this is the way it is. And from 325 B.C., when Constantine kind of... Uh, Gave a rubber stamp. He was the emperor of Rome at the time. And gave a rubber stamp to Christian Christianity, which had already become pretty Catholic by then. And the government of Rome and the Church of Catholicism synced together and became buddies. It's never good for government and the church to be too close together never good one of our watermarkers and I were talking about this the other day because good sometimes doesn't really have influence over bad in most cases bad is going to influence the good change the good therefore the apostle Paul said have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness <laughs> Don't even fellowship with it. So anyway, that's a whole nother sermon. So they, they hooked up together, and Rome fed the Catholic Church's power. The Catholic Church fed Rome power and money. And from about 325 A.D. to the late, late 1400s, that was Christian living. You didn't have a Bible. You didn't have a, you had a priest who supposedly forgave your sins if you confessed them and told you how to make penance for them. Sometimes that involved giving money. You had a Catholic theology that said, you know, yeah, your uncle passed away and, and uh, you know, he's dead and he's in purgatory. He didn't quite make it to heaven. He's in purgatory. 
How can I help Uncle Joe? How can I get him out of there and on to heaven? Well, grease the palm. You pay. Now, I'm going to leave Uncle Joe there. He's on his own. That's Catholic theology. None of that's in Scripture. So the Pope spoke, ex cathedra, still does, and supposedly anything that comes out of his mouth is divinely inspired just like the Scripture. And this is what the Reformers sought to reform. They didn't create a new Bible. They didn't create a new church. They didn't create a new uh, theology. They wanted to reform the Catholic Church and get it back to the teachings of Scripture, which was salvation by grace through faith alone. They didn't start anything new. They wanted to take people back to the New Testament, back to the Bible. And again, some of them gave their lives for it. But it is a gift. And for that, we should be grateful. But I can rest knowing my salvation is a gift from God based on the finished work of His Son at the cross and the empty tomb. Solely based on that, based on nothing I could bring or offer. And I can rest, believing Philippians 1, 6, that he who has begun a good work in me, he will see it through to the end. When Jesus said, come all to, come all to me, ye weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what he meant. All you religious, busy people, nothing, nothing wrong with religious stuff, nothing wrong with church and baptism and doing good, nothing wrong with that, but none of it saves you. And Jesus speaks to these religiously weary people in his day who, are, who run to the temple and make sacrifices and do everything the Pharisees and Sadducees said do, and they just try to please them and please them and please them, and in essence think they're pleasing God and gaining cred with God and Jesus comes along and says come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden you will find rest in me man that's good news that's good news so it's a gift number three I gotta slow down I'm I'm getting old and short-winded, losing my breath. I guess I need to quit being so passionate about this, huh? <laughs> Justification takes place for those whom God calls. Let's be clear. Let's go back to Romans 8, 30. And those God predestined, he also called, and those he called, he justified. I don't have to share with you that verse in the Greek and tell you what it means in the Greek. That's pretty simple. God, in his infinite love, compassion, and mercy, chose those whom he would call those he calls he saves he saves let me reread this verse those he predestined he called and those he called he justifies if they make a decision to let him is that what the verse says Is that what it says? Mm -mm. 
God is the source of salvation. He is the bringer of salvation. He is the executor of salvation. He is the finisher of salvation. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justifies. End of sentence. Now here's the thing. We follow a hermeneutical principle called this. Scripture interprets Scripture. You can't take one verse and build a whole theology on it. Scripture interprets Scripture. There's other Scriptures. But you will find when you study the New Testament, honestly with open eyes, that other Scriptures agree with this one. And there's no conflict here. So justification takes place for those whom God calls. Okay, who is going to be saved? Who is going to be justified? Let's back up those he called. Amen? Who's going to be saved? Those whom he has called, justified. Those whom he called. Who's going to be called? Those whom he predestined. It works both ways. So God issues a specific call to specific people that results in a specific justification. A specific justification. You see, understand the Bible teaches clearly that the salvation that God offers in Jesus is not hit or miss. It is not haphazard. When Jesus died on the cross, none of his blood will be wasted. You can write this down and go think about it and email me later. Jesus' death on the cross, his blood atonement, He died to save. He died to save. He didn't die just to offer salvation. To say he died to offer salvation means that Jesus' blood, some of it would be wasted. And his blood is royal and regal and precious. And Jesus isn't going to waste his blood. When Jesus died on the cross, he died to save. That's why he said, those whom the Father put in my hand. For them I die. Well, you know, I just, I just, I, I, I just never, I never. Well, here's the scriptures. Open them. Jesus would dare not, God the Father would dare not waste one drop of his precious son's blood for a haphazard salvation. For something that might happen. Jesus died to save. It takes place for those whom God calls. Going back to the fact again that you are not in charge of salvation. God is. One more thing and we'll stop. Justification is an instantaneous and forensic act of God. Romans 5, 9. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood. <laughs> how am I justified? By being a good person. By joining the Watermark Church. I'm justified by one thing. 
the regal, royal, precious blood of the Son of the living God. Being justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Now this is, this is court language here. This is legal language. First of all, it is instantaneous. Salvation is not a process over time. It's not a, a process of becoming better and better till you reach a certain point at which God will accept you. And there's people that believe that. But it's not. It's instantaneous, as is regeneration, washing, sanctification. A couple of more things we're going to talk about. It's instantaneous. It's like this. So you are not put on probation. You are not pulled close to see how you do. You are justified by grace, through faith, instantaneously, because it doesn't depend on you or me. It depends on the instantaneous work of the Holy Spirit. It's instantaneous. Jesus gave parables to illustrate theology and, and, and things. And he told one of our favorite parables, I'm sure all of us, prodigal son. He had this kid great family. He decides he wants to go do his own thing. Well, that's what we've all done. We've left the father's house. Adam launched us into the departure from the father's, father's house. He went and blew his life, blew his money, so forth, wound up sleeping with the hogs, decided, you know, dad's bed was a whole lot better than this. I think a lot of kids understand that sometime, don't you? He said, you know, my father, I'm going to go back and beg, plead, I'm going I'm to repent, I'm going I'm to beg his forgiveness, I'm gonna, and I'm going to say, God, I'm going to say, Father, I don't even want to be a son anymore, just make me a slave. Just let me be a servant. I'll live in the bunkhouse, I'll slop the hogs, I'll feed the chickens, I'll do what your servants do, just let me come back home. And he had a speech that he never got to make. So he heads toward back home, and the father sees him afar off. And the father runs out to meet him and greets him and puts the family robe on him and puts the family uh, signet ring on his hand. And he tries to start his speech, and the father won't even let him. And, 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 and he, he immediately restores him to the son position that he had before he rebelled. rebelled. And it was instantaneous. Son, come on in. My son who was lost is now found. And they threw a party. And they killed the fatted calf. And they hired Leonard Skinner. And they had a party. My son is home. How did that happen? How long did the father take to decide whether or not he was going to let him come back home? In fact, while he saw him way down the road, he went and got him. Salvation is instantaneous. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. It is once for all. I'll kind of come back to that next week. But it's a one, once for all act. only happens one time. If you get justified by God, it will never, ever happen again. You will never lose your justification. It's once for all. Read the book of Hebrews. It is in conjunction with regeneration, washing, sanctification. But then forensically, this is the legal idea. Forensically, this is what justification does. We are in wrong standing with God. I am standing on the guilty side of the courtroom. I'm guilty. And God is the judge. And God's holy. And God demands perfection. And I am none of that. And I'm guilty. And I'm under the wrath of the court. And God, the holy judge, has every right to give me the sentence of his desire. He is in charge. 
And that sentence is his wrath and his condemnation and an eternity separated from him. And he has every right to do that. He's God. But legally and forensically, not to make it too uh, flippant, but my defense lawyer comes up, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus has worked something in my spirit. He has saved me. He has just and so I am justified. I am moved from this guilty place where all these accusatory fingers, and po- where the law of God in the Old Testament is pointing toward me and indicting me. And justification brings me out from under all that. And justification releases me from the wrath of God, the condemnation of God. I am released from that. Do I deserve it? Yes. But through grace, I am released of it. And I moved in status from guilty to innocent innocent my status my standing changes this is something actually where regeneration and washing and the sealing of the spirit all that is done inside of us this is something that actually kind of on the outside of us it happens in God's courtroom and we're moved and then we who are out of square with God We become square with God. Square with God. See, see, the problem of the lost person today, oh, I believe in God. Yeah, I believe. That doesn't make you square with God. You may believe in God, but are you square with God through justification? Square with God. And justification does that. It declares the guilty sinner righteous you're not going to like this but it is like a mass murderer standing in a courtroom who's killed people destroyed lives wreaked havoc and that's you and me and a judge bringing a gavel down And saying, innocent, do I pronounce you. You're free to go. Did your brain just snap? Mine does. I don't like that. I want justice. And in our legal society, we need that justice. But folks, this is what it's like. You and I and all of our depravity, and rejection of God, and hatred toward God, and, and, and sin toward God, and rebellion, and disobedience. We stand in the courtroom before a holy and just God. And he renders by grace through faith. He renders guilty people innocent. And here's the thing. You may not like that illustration, but you better be glad for it because that's what God has done for you through Jesus Christ. I was guilty, but I have been rendered innocent because of Christ. My sins forgiven in him, in his blood, his robe of righteousness wrapped around me, the Bible says. And this depraved sinner who once hated God has now through the work of the precious Christ stands before a holy God not on probation, not on a wait and we'll see system, but stands before a holy God in the righteousness of Christ himself Forgiven, pure, sanctified, clean. Justification changes my status. Declaring sinners 
righteous. And the holy God, the judge, brings the gavel down and declares one righteous and justified with the court, right with the court. And it is recorded, and it is recorded in, in heaven. And I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Let's just stop there. It's recorded in heaven. Well, let me go ahead and say one more sentence. And it will never be erased. What God records, what he brings his gavel down on is for eternity. Is that enough to either cause you to praise God or get mad? One way or the other. Thank God for salvation by grace through faith alone. Thank God for justification. Am I perfect? No. But my status is solid with Christ. And it will never change. Because it's not based on my goodness or imperfections or anything. It's based on the completed, finished work of Christ at the cross. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much.